Guten Morgen, meine Freunde, und willkommen to the Blast from the Past. It's my task to broadcast. This week we visit one of the most underrated of years, wedged as it is between two of the heavy hitters of the historical hit parade. This being the week ending 21st of April 1972. At number 10, two weeks in and rising 28 places, and spoiler alert, up to number one next week, is The First Time Ever I Saw Your Face by Roberta Flack. Propelled up the charts, no doubt, by its prominent inclusion on the soundtrack of Clint Eastwood's huge hit movie Play Misty for me, it's a little unfair to lean too heavily on that fact as Flack had more than paid her dues and was a mature and highly principled singer by that point. Although this was her first hit, it was far from her last as she became an instantly recognisable voice of both pop and AOR stations across the next 25 years, with five Billboard number no. 1 hits. Roberta Flack trivia, she was John Lennon's across the hallway neighbour in the Dakota building. Number 9, Carol King, one of the supreme songwriters of her generation, has only managed three top 10 hits so far in her career as a singer, but she did have a fourth in my hometown with Sweet Seasons, which despite tapping out at number 19 nationally made it to number 4 here. It's a disposable piece of pop fluff, but so is the locomotion, which shows off King's native strength. Irresistible tunes with more hooks than a convention of pirates. Is it just me? And if there's one thing that I've learned from the internet is that it's never just me, and people usually just ask it to attract comments and seem relatable. Or would this song not sound out of place on Steely Dan's first album? In at number 8 is a song which is indelibly burned into my brain as one of my favourite records of those early radio years. Listening to it for research here, it's the first time I'd heard it for an age, and it's glorious, magnificent. Of course, I'm talking about Son of My Father by Chicory Tip. One of the few songs I can't understand a single word of what the lyrics mean, but what a groove. The massive farty moog synth, cool swishy drumming, the football terrace chant of a chorus. This was as good as it got for the tipsters though, spending another week at eight before slipping down the charts thereafter. At number seven, simply one of the greatest Australian records of all time, Billy Thorpe and the Aztecs, most people I know think that I'm crazy. Thorpe was crazy. He was passionate, funny, a great songwriter, a committed rocker, a brutal guitarist, a showman non pareil, and a fun guy beloved by every audience he ever played for. Coming out of my hometown, in the mid-60s in the wake of the Bee Gees, by 1972 he had three distinct incarnations, wild tormentor of teeny boppers and hard rockers alike, pop balladeer and ever-present music festival fixture, maker of the first triple album in Australian history and ear-splitting volume merchant. And two more incarnations were to follow. Had he lived a little longer, National Treasure would have been the sixth. Fantastic as most people I know think that I'm crazy was, say it quietly. But the follow-up, Believe It Just Like Me, was even better. Number six is the mysterious, at least to me, Follow Your Drum by Don Farden. It must be said that Farden isn't the greatest singer ever known to the top 40, but he gets the job done, I guess. And the song has a rough and ready more rock than country, country rock vibe to it. An unmemorable record, but this is a place where we remember just such things. Some fantastical facts for those with a fetish for folder roll. As mentioned, the fastest ride upward this week was Roberta Flack's first time ever I saw your face. Going in the other direction was that wonderful group we recently spoke about, Badfinger, with another of their classics, Day After Day, which dropped eight places to number 37. Top spot in the US this week was the first time ever I saw your face, and in the UK it was the pipes and drums and the military band of the Royal Scots Guard and their skirling version of Amazing Grace, which held the top spot for five weeks before T-Rex put an end to all this foolishness with the rather magnificent metal guru. The number one album about town was American Pie by Don McLean. 1972 was the year of the mega album on our charts. Teaser and the Firecat by Cat Stevens spent 15 weeks on top, some of those were in 1971. Slade Alive spent 12 weeks, both American Pie and Thick as a Brick 11 weeks each. Catch Bullet 4 by that man Cat spent 7 weeks there. And with that, it's bye bye to the fabulous facts and back to the half of the top 10 that in the grand scheme of things matters mostest.
At number five, a massive hit on its way down the charts, the 109th biggest hit ever in the city that knows its top 40 stuff, Without You by Harry Nelson. Originally recorded by the, once again, criminally underrated Badfinger, this song has a tragic coda in so much that the legal dispute over authorship was a precipitating factor in co-writer Tom Evans deciding to end it all in 1973. But the song, described by Paul McCartney as the killer ballad of all time with its gentle and sentimental verse and soaring intense chorus, was album filler for Badfinger. But it was Nilsson, with his overdeveloped sense of theatre, who doubled down on every strength of the song, making it a grand guignol of contemporary pop, or perhaps the first ever power ballad. Perhaps Billy Thorpe's only peer as a local singer-songwriter rocker was Russell Morris, and he's at number four this week with Live With Friends, my personal favourite of his many hits, and another was song which overperformed in my hometown where it peaked at number four as opposed to nationally where it got to number 13. It's a bit similar to Without You, a sad reflective verse and a more intense chorus, but it's a lot more intimate and sincere sounding. Morris has had a long career approaching 50 years and is today one of the most respected blues performers in Australia, with a rare eye for Australian subjects and folklore in his lyrics. But he'll still trot out the old favourites, including his 1969 number one, The Real Thing, which was the first Australian 45 to cost over $10,000 to produce. Third in the grand scheme of things, coming in at number three as it does, is the erstwhile king of Australian country music, Johnny Chester, then at the peak of his chart viability. He's represented by Sir Lancelot's well-travelled Calypso, or a countrified version thereof at least, Shame and Scandal, which dates back from the early 40s. A silly novelty song, its chief virtue is that it's short. Fun Johnny Chester fact, back in 1964, he and his band The Chessmen opened up for The Beatles on their 1964 tour of Australia and New Zealand. The Cornelia Ender of the charts this week is, somewhat surprisingly, Dolly Parton with her wonderful coat of many colours. I say surprisingly because to most people, Dolly isn't really a thing until Jolene surfaced some years after its original release, to herald the plastic fantastic version of Dolly in the late 70s. But she was, of course, a long-established treasure on the country music scene for almost 10 years before that, for her work with Porter Wagner and her own remarkable string of albums in the late 60s and early 70s, for her astonishing voice, which even today improves and becomes an ever more expressive instrument, and the quality of her songwriting. This particular song, because Dolly couldn't get any paper to hand on the tour bus where she wrote it, was scribbled on the back of a dry cleaner's receipt for one of Porter Wagner's nudie suits. Wagner made sure to keep the receipt after claiming the suit, and later donated it, the receipt that is, to Dolly's Chasing Rainbows Museum in Dollywood. A song which only Dolly Parton could write, and if anyone else did, they'd just be ripping off Dolly Parton. It's almost mawkishly sentimental, but it has a pride and a sense of dignity to it, and cloying as it may feel seems uncomfortably real. It's no down from Dover, but a great many people do think it's her greatest song, and when you're as great a songwriter as Dolly Parton is, close to your best is better than most other writers will ever get. Wow, how do you follow Dolly? Let's see if the number one record in this town matches up to the quality of the Dollity. Play us in, Gene. After all that, after all the great records this week on the charts, it's a bit of a letdown that America's limpid horse with no name, with its pallid Neil Youngisms, Young himself had Heart of Gold at number 27, and frankly gibberish lyrics should hold the number one spot. Randy Newman, with his usual withering sarcasm, described the song as being about a kid who thinks he's just taken acid for the first time. The tune is pleasant enough, certainly, and the arrangement with its odd guitar tuning is interesting. It's far from the worst example of wimp rock you can imagine, and it is a song of its time. Forever late 71, early 72. A naive and peaceful time before we killed all the hippies. And there we have it. A fantastic top 40 from a week in which was for me personally one of the most important years for music ever. The radio fairly bursting with great hits 24-7. All of these songs were on the top 40 but south of the top 10 this week. 
Mother and Child Reunion by Paul Simon, American Pie by Don McLean, Day After Day by Badfinger, Stay With Me by The Faces, Papa Joe by The Sweet, Red Bones Witch Queen of New Orleans, Hurting Each Other from the Carpenters, Cat Stevens' Morning is Broken, Kiss an Angel Good Morning by Charlie Pride. There are a good handful of country songs on the chart this week. And my favourite ever song from my favourite ever band, Telegram Sam by T-Rex, backed by the mighty Cadillac on the B-side. T-Rex had the best B-sides. This week, the super secret scoring algorithm gives a score of 7.1 out of 10. All that remains, therefore, is to implore you for comments in the section below, or to leave a like, or subscribe, or do something else that gives you pleasure. And I'll see you again next time, both in the future, which is a mist-shrouded illusion, and in the past, which is a foreign country.